All right, so welcome back to the live stream today. We're gonna be jumping into custody and how some of this is really going to be playing into the markets from an overall aspect of institutions as well as retail investors. We'll dive into all that. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back in Tech Path. You know, when you look at the market, one of the things that we always look at is where is institutional grade finance going to start rolling into cryptocurrencies? And some of the things that we track is a lot of the companies that start to create all of that kind of stuff. So we'll be diving into that with a special guest today. I want to thank our sponsors, of course, I Trust Capital, uh, for sponsoring these kinds of shows because we get to, a chance to dive in deep with a lot of C-level executives in the crypto space. And really, if you're looking for uh, extending your own crypto holdings, take a look at doing a crypto IRA. Easy to do. We'll leave a link in the show description down at the bottom so you guys can jump in. Joining me today is, of course, Seamus Donahue, Donahue, which is the Chief Growth Officer over at Mataco. Seamus has uh, a ton of experience both in the FinCEN markets, but also in a lot of operations uh, running kind of the global aspect from financial centers from J.P. Morgan, Deutsche Bank, uh, Barclays, Bank of America, and Merrill Lynch. Uh, so we want to thank him for uh, shopping in, stopping in today. Seamus, great to have you on the show. Well, thanks for having me. Excellent. So Mataco, let's learn quickly just about Mataco. Uh, you guys, of course, are providing some institutional grade um, security. Obviously, this rolls into banks and larger uh, f- finance groups out there. Explain what Mataco, Mataco is uh, for our viewers. That's a good question. Mataco is a software technology company. We're based in Lausanne, Switzerland. We're about 60 people. Um, but we have a, a global operation, and I would say we our, our focus is providing the core foundational infrastructure primarily to to financial institutions or infrastructure providers, financial institutions, to provide them the core foundational infrastructure to manage digital assets, be that crypto or token. So it's really a let's call it a core banking system for the new new asset class. So Seamus, when you when you look at, um, and I do want to let our, our crew know if we can bring his audio up just a little bit. Uh, when you look at kind of the, obviously you guys recently, the reason we got you on the show was the news on Citibank. And when you look at the financial institutions overall, banks, of course, have started to really uh, engage in this category. Obviously, JP Morgan is starting to move in this direction. We've seen their partnership with Coinbase. How far along do you think it will be before we start to see mass entrance into the space from the banking side? I think it's happening now. I mean, I think you know, you've had, a, well, the last 10, 10 to 12 years, you've had a lot of innovation in the crypto space, you know, as a digital assets. And it's really been dominated by fintechs, let's say the VC market, VC mentality of ship code, move things fast. And it's really been small asset managers that have been the early adopters. If you look, look at the institutional side, hedge funds, prop desks. Um, that, that space is moved very quickly, um, but I think with the in 2021, with the price, the, the price acceleration we saw, and with some right. of the early adopters like State Street, uh, the BNYs, uh, BBVA, Standard Charter Bank, they, of course Fidelity as well. I think there's now been basically the price drives demand. There's institutional competitive pressure to move, and as you mentioned, you know, mentioned uh, BlackRock, which is everybody's biggest client, there's actually institutional client pull now as well. So the institutions are building. You've seen a number of announcements from us, but you see announcements across the industry. And uh, I think it's not just the U.S., but we're seeing this globally, where banks are embracing this asset class. Regulators are defined in a roadmap in most countries. And uh, the, the, the institutional build is accelerating. What you've seen so far, it's, it's like the icebergs. We've had very public announcements, but there's a lot happening under the hood. I don't think any major institution doesn't have a digital asset strategy now. Yeah. All right. So this is good news, I think, for investors globally. It is going to most likely put, I think, this asset class on the map, even though it's been on the map. But I think a lot of people look at this as still as an emerging asset class. Obviously, when you bring in banks, major institutional finance, it starts to definitely give credibility uh, to the space. With that being the case, and you look at the asset classes that are kind of... um, really kind of centered in obviously being Bitcoin, but I'm also looking at some banks that are moving into Ethereum as a major class and other potentials out there. Do you see other tokens flowing into this overall strategy for banks and other institutions to start supporting? I think there's no doubt. I think a year ago was probably a Bitcoin only. Ethereum was the the next in line. 
but I think there's a broader acceptance of, of public blockchains. The tools are, are the tools out there to analyze these blockchains are, are widely available now and cover a much broader set of currencies. I would say the way banks the way banks are looking at it is a little bit different than crypto natives. I think the, the asset class as a whole is still at its peak was only three trillion, and we're talking about either side of one trillion now. So it's still relatively small, it's small much smaller than Apple, for example. So yeah. I think for, to a degree, the, the crypto space is still a space for the, the banks can go to market, they can monetize it in terms of there's a business case, there's client demand, so they can build a business around, they can learn the operational risk and regulatory requirements. But ultimately, their eyes on a bigger, uh, bigger opportunity. I mean, no doubt the crypto space will continue its exponential growth despite the set setbacks we've seen in the last year. Um, but I think there's a broad acceptance at the institutional banking level, and I think this is a fundamental difference from the early adopters that were the small asset managers. The banks realize or have a view that eventually all assets will sit on chain. So all the traditional assets they manage, uh, you know, crypto space is one trillion, traditional asset space is somewhere between three and 500 trillion. Yeah. Eventually all those assets will sit on the same infrastructures. So they have a core infrastructure, a transformational view of this technology across every asset class. Bit Bitcoin, Ethereum, the broader set of cryptocurrencies is just the starting point. Yeah, I think this is, uh, I've had a chance to speak and talk with a lot of people in the, in the finance sector. And one of the biggest points that they're often making is just to the point you're, you're talking about, which is this digital conversion or the tokenization, I think, of what asset classes are kind of facing now, which is good for, I think, blockchain in general. Also, I think, and generally, when you're looking at retail investors, it also starts to drag forward a lot of the retail investment, including just small investors, to really start to understand how the space works. Because the biggest scenario that I think most retail faces right now, unless you're drinking the Kool-Aid super early like we are, is security. You know, so they want to get in with something that is super safe. Hey, listen, it's you know whether it's uh, you know someone on Main Street or it's mom and pop type uh, investors. Banks are typically the place where they look to. Uh, for security. So I think digital assets are going to be a big play in there. With that being the case, and you look at traditional finance, obviously we saw the big move with, uh, with BlackRock uh, this last week, uh, obviously with Coinbase as a big part of this. And you look at Citibank, obviously your partner and many others, when you think about the asset class that these banks are starting to manage, how much of that asset class do you think will start to convert to digital assets, say, over the next five years? Do you think there's a one-digit, two-digit number here uh, in terms of conversion? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. I don't have the answer. But I'd say a prerequisite for that to happen is really the banks need the infrastructure, right? And uh, you know, when we're talking about U.S. banks, you probably need more clarity around regulation. I think what we're right. going to see basically after some of the setbacks we've had with um, so, you know, whether it's Celsius or, you know, Three Arrows Capital or other, other issues, Terra, the Terra network, um, there's going to be more regulation. There's going to be more regulation on the retail front. So I, I think that, that to a degree is, is viewed by some in the native crypto space as a negative. But actually, I think from a banking perspective, it's the positive. They're, they understand how to operate under regulations and the guidelines give them a framework where they're comfortable that uh, they can minimize regulatory risk on their side. Because obviously, fines have been a big part of the banking space the last 20 years. Right. Um, so I, I think basically what the number is, I don't know, but a prerequisite is they have the infrastructure, they've got the client base, so they deliver the on-ramps. And, you know, the, the markets have been in a setback the last year, but I think demand, you know, demand will, will again, will, will go back to an environment where we're in another bull-up leg. And, uh, you know, we'll see where that takes us. But I expect the, the longer-term view of crypto assets is still an exponential future. Um, and uh, once those, those on-ramps are built through the, the banks, which have the retail client base, I mean, look at an example of Citibank. It's public, 100 million clients, basically, right? That's yeah. significant access. So whether they per give day one permission for crypto or not is not really the point. The main infrastructure is, is being the foundations there. The core financial players are going to deliver that capability. And the, re everybody's, the rest of your asset classes are sitting with the banks. So crypto, is a, crypto or digital assets is a very natural extension to trust them with as well. All right, so when you look at the, the roadmap here, because this obviously is going to take some time for adoption, both with uh, structured capital, obviously um, groups like Citibank and others, you look at BlackRock, JP Morgan, there's many that are gonna start to move in this space. Uh, we started to see other small banks and regional banks even start to talk about this in, in a big way, actually act upon it. Um, how far along do you think it is before from an infrastructure standpoint, if you look at the roadmap for a major institution like a Citibank, we'll use them as kind of the poster child. 
Is that a roadmap that takes a year or longer to develop to get to the infrastructure to be able to pull the trigger and make that available? Yeah, I won't, I won't comment specifically on Citibank, but I would say basically if you look at all the major banks, you know, many of them have been around for 50 or 100 years, and their core infrastructure is legacy, is layers of legacy upon legacy. I right. Mean, think of it as a spaghetti. Uh, and to a larger degree, none of them want to touch it because the, the people that built the foundation of it are no longer around. It may be on COBOL or something like this that nobody really mm -hmm. understands anymore. So I, I think what you're seeing is basically the idea is this new infrastructure is eventually there to replace all of that stack. Um, so the, the starting point will be an integration, but eventually migration of assets into the new core infrastructure. Integrations, I think, you're, you're talking about probably go to market for all, any major institution is probably somewhere between six months and 18 months. Um, yeah. So I think that's, as you hear firms announce, they're probably already fairly advanced in those plans, but I think that's the general thing for a large, larger institution. That's a good point you made uh, in essence of kind of rebuilding rather than building on top of the blocks that you know the, the, the infrastructure of current banking systems are built on. Because this really is kind of an evolution in finance and it is an opportunity, I think, for some markets. Do you think we'll see some new players, uh, whether it's a neobanks or you know some of the new banks that are starting to rise up that are more somewhat crypto friendly? Or do you think it will be the traditional you know, household names in finance that will be making the biggest leaps forward? I mean, I think there's no question there's new names. I think those new names, we see them now. We already, it's a, I think probably some of the larger banks are probably quite shocked that Coinbase won the BlackRock right. mandate, at least the initial one. Yep. So I, I think we've seen over the last five, six years, we've seen some of those firms emerge into a very large competitive size versus traditional finance. But I think with the setbacks we've had in, you know, let's say the retail side of the crypto business, some of the, the scandals we've seen in the crypto space, Trust is a little bit lacking from some of the fintech natives now. I think there's a there's a potentially a bias towards those names you trust. No, those names you know, those names you trust, and in right. particular those names with balance sheet, and that are already regulated. Uh, so I think there's a real advantage to, at least for the near term, for the large incumbent banks to get into the space and build their presence. If not, I think over time the crypto natives can, will, will have a potential to be very large players. But I think the banks have a significant opportunity right now as regulation starts coming down. The banks, they're one of their key USPs is navigating regulation. They already have the clients um, and uh, they have the balance sheet, which is critical. Seamus, you get a chance to talk to uh, global financial leaders worldwide and you look at what's happening here in the United States. Uh, you look at Europe, uh, obviously a strengthening factor in terms of cryptocurrency. South America, a fast growth you know, category in a lot of countries starting to look at really kind of nation states looking at digital currencies and, and just digital assets in general as being a new source of potential economic, you know, freedom to a certain extent. Asia also, a, a, you know, a fast growth uh, sector as well in terms of geographically. Is there one area of the globe right now that you feel is in a little bit better position to kind of leap in and take the lead? It's, it's a good question. I mean, we live in a dollar-based system. Right? It's a global dollar-based system. So I think the U.S. has a great advantage in terms of the biggest players. As they adopt it, it will have the biggest impact. But there's no doubt there are certain specific geographies, and we've seen it the, even the evolution of our company. Um, we're based in Switzerland, but we've had some of the, you know, and Switzerland's a great example where FINMA, the regulator right. in Switzerland, defined very clear regulatory framework for the banks. We had markets like uh, Singapore, the MAS there did the same soon after Germany with Baffin. And, I mean, those markets with that regulation space saw a very fast moving kind of adoption by the industry. Switzerland a little bit slower because it's by default it's a more conservative sector, but I mean, Singapore has been exceptional in growth. Crypto is you know, on the MAS's tongue with every other announcement basically. So it's, they really view it as the, as the core future. Uh, Germany is the same thing. We're seeing that broaden across Europe. And as you said, LATAM, I think we're seeing the same thing. So I think to us, it's really about regulation and regulation I think is starting to catch up and, and broaden in terms of its clarity. The U.S. still has some to work to do. There's too much fighting, infighting between the different regulators in terms of land grab. So there's some, yeah. there's a lack of clarity there, which once, once that gets resolved, I think things will really accelerate globally from a U.S. dollar perspective. Do you think, okay, so this is something that I have in terms of a theory around uh, regulatory bodies. We look at obviously What's happening with CFTC and the SEC here, to your point, is there is a lot of infighting within government agencies. And we are entering kind of a new class of digital asset. Uh, I was talking, you know, Kevin O'Leary kind of goes to this point of it's the next 
what is it, the 12th sector uh, within the investment classes that have developed over the last three, four decades. If you look at that, do you feel like we'll, we potentially could see either global and or um, regional, you know, from a country basis, new sorts of regulatory bodies develop to help understand and regulate the digital asset class as it, as it starts to mature? That would be wonderful, but I'm not sure that's <laughs> in the near-term future. The we Nirvana. see that on a European basis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've seen it, obviously, specific countries have been the lead in Europe, Germany as an example, and now we're seeing the broader EU embrace embrace regulations, which uh, you can passport across, across the region. Um, I can't say I see that's a common story elsewhere. I mean, Asia is very fragmented, and obviously North America is what it is. The mm -hmm. um, U.S., even within the country, has different rates. So it's a, yeah, a nirvana. Hopefully it comes, but let's see. A couple of things in terms of trends. Um, we've seen some pretty bad uh, hiccups, I think, on the road here, obviously with crypto this year. Voyager, uh, Celsius, two big black eyes for the industry. Luna, yeah. obviously three arrows capital. Do you think we'll see more of that in the space, or do you feel like we've kind of settled down to a certain extent based on what you know of the market? I mean, I think these things take time to filter through, and whether you find out eventually all the uh, who is swimming naked when the tide goes out, as, uh, as uh, Warren Buffett says. But I think the big events have probably happened. We've probably had a lot of the flush from, from liquidations from those things. I think the market's probably on more solid footing, and it's going to be more driven by macro factors. Um, and I think as the banks come into the space, they're going to be less sensitive to price because they have, as I said, their their view is not just the crypto price. Um, their yeah. view is basically this is transformation technology. And we're moving to your point earlier. The emphasis in the banks is not so much about build fast and break things, which is I would define as the last era, but it's really about security and compliance. And I think this should really engender a lot more trust of the industry as a whole, as a whole basically, that uh, your assets are safe. Um, there's some regulation behind it. It's not completely... Uh, the bank's not lending their entire balance sheet to another fintech, which can take them down, but based on that one uncollateralized loan. So I right. think there's more responsibility. There's more adults in the room, let's say, I think, going forward. Interesting. All right. Okay. So two uh, major investment areas, obviously retail, uh, huge in terms, especially in the, the current crypto space, retail is a big factor. Then you have, of course, the evolution of um, family offices, private equity, all sorts of mid-tier investment classes that will start to move into this space and then obviously the structured. Where do you think the, the growth is going to come from once that these banks really start to offer these services to the general public? And, you know, in general, anyone that wants to come in rather than, you know, someone like a, you know, a BlackRock who's doing a deal with Coinbase, but, you know, a traditional investors, where do you think the growth is going to come from? I think the initial adoption will really be on through the banks will be in the institutional side. I think there'll be some hesitancy to go full full bore on retail simply because um, the events you mentioned, although we mm -hmm. haven't seen the regulators necessarily clamp down, we know regulators, regulators operate with a lag. And I think there'll be a lot of questions about uh, investor protection on the retail side, which they are slightly different considerations on the institutional side. So I think the institutional side, whether it's NFTs, um, which bring people along into Ethereum and not potentially right. other, other um, other protocols that support similar similar applications. I think there's already a lot of demand on the corporate level to, through the banks there. Um, and that could be the, let's say, the gateway drug into a broader adoption um, there. So I do think it's the institutional side will drive initial sort of rollout. Interesting point too, because this is something that obviously the current market right now, our audience, um, you know, I would say right now we're averaging about a million viewers a month on on our show. And we see a lot of new people coming in from the retail sector, but we also see a lot of seasoned investors that have been through two, maybe even three, um, you know, bear cycles. And uh, the scenario that we're kind of alluding to is that if we see the institutional money come in to this level, that the, op the obvious is that we're going to see that lagging retail market really start to explode, whether it's a year or two years behind that. Uh, will be, but the the people that are obviously in these asset classes right now, obviously, are going to benefit from that. When you think about that, and you look at the trends that could potentially dictate markets, right now it's either adoption or we see macro trends. Everything from ec economic conditions. Obviously, we had the CPI just came out today, um, downward here in the U.S., so that's a good sign to a certain extent. Even the course they, CPI pretty much stayed flat. But when you look at macro versus adoption, which one do you feel like, or, or maybe both, which one do you feel like is the leading 
potential to really drive this into a respectable asset class in the future? That's a good question. I think right now macro macro is dominating the narrative. I mean, obviously, uh, what we've seen in the last probably six months is uh, you know, there's been different narratives that you know, crypto is a store of wealth or you know, diversification. But we've seen it's actually the way it's traded has been at the extreme end of uh, kind of risky assets. So the macro trends is, as risky assets have been repriced with the, the rise in rates and then withdrawal of liquidity, they've, we've seen a, a very significant drawdown in, in pricing. Um, and as the environment's changing a little bit, as you say, we get 8.5 uh, versus right. the previous 9.1 in inflation, people get a little more comfort in the, the rallying risky assets. I think that's still the main narrative. But I, I think as the institutions come, as the institutions build kind of more uh, on ramps, make this easy for inst for individuals to, to move in and out. You don't have to go through a whole KYC process at an exchange because you're already right. on board with your bank. Mm -hmm. um, I think that starts to put a floor on the price basically over time. I would agree with that. I think that you're, you're to a good point there because that is still, to a certain extent, a little bit of a, uh, you know, a level of a threshold of difficulty, I think, for most investors, especially retail, because that, that is a problem. I just got a chance to speak at a business event the other night and we're high net worth individuals and still very, very skeptical of just the onboarding process within the exchanges. So versus, say, a bank. So to your point, exactly. Uh, let's talk about uh, stable coins, because this could be something that really starts to play into the banking industry, uh, especially around USDC, uh, even Tether to a certain extent. Your thoughts on whether or not regulation, we think regulatory uh, positioning is going to happen here in the U.S. in this next midterms could really kind of spawn a good group of bills that could get passed from a bipartisan level around U.S. Uh, stable coins. D is that something that you think has to happen uh, for banks to maybe look at other digital assets outside the U.S. dollar? Well, I think it's critical that we have uh, some sort of settlement leg that's basically uh, that's digitized. So you have this, mm -hmm. you know, obviously one of the key advantages of, of crypto is the, or blockchain is basically the notion of atomic settlement. And right. if you need to wire fiat to the exchange or wire fiat to a counterparty to settle trade, it's uh, you know two days and the price is 30% different on the crypto leg. So exactly. um, and I think it's it's critical we have a stable coin or CBDC. Um, I hope it's a, a, a private initiative in the stable coin space. And I, with no doubt we're seeing that driven more and more into the banking sector, or let's say more regulated like a bank would be, um, which I think again is probably going to help with the trust. Um, you've already seen the trust of the asset class, let's say. Um, you already have some companies in the space that set themselves as trust where the assets are bankruptcy remote and they're, you know, they're, they're protected. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of initiatives there, and now you've got the asset class has grown dramatically. You're 150 billion now in stable coins. So I think I continue to be. If you're going to tokenize assets, I think the first thing you need to tokenize is the notion of a, let's say a payment or a stable coin to be able to tokenize anything else. Otherwise, how can you settle those assets? So right. um, get the maximum advantage of tokenized assets in the first instance. So I think the low hanging fruit really is the stable coin space. Um, hopefully, the regulatory environment is regulatory rules that drop, as you said, are constructive. Because otherwise, I think it's a fantastic uh, area of growth in the, in, in the, in the crypto space. So uh, a couple of la last questions for you. I would agree on the stablecoin aspect. I do feel like this is going to be a big factor with banks. And, and we've just already seen such growth in stablecoins. Self-custody, you know, from the retail side, we're seeing more of that even within stablecoins uh, being utilized for self-custody. And obviously, Circle's uh, goal to try to onboard a lot of investors now with their direct uh, to Circle itself. So there are a lot of initiatives in play. When you look at all of the landscape of where the market is going, you kind of look at where the economy, obviously, from a global perspective, all eyes are on the U.S. Uh, to essentially kind of manage and navigate what we're seeing here right now in terms of a, a recession. With that being the case, and with the market as it is right now, you guys obviously see much more global macro trends. Do you feel like this is something that we would or could start to see a correction toward the end of the year or early next year in the markets themselves? Sorry, correction in, in the crypto asset prices? or Yeah, crypto asset prices are just in general the perspective around crypto assets as a whole. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we've seen a lot of that already. I mean, the, the crypto market is very forward-looking. We've had huge drawdowns. So I think, I mean, we could obviously test new lows. We could get Bitcoin down to 10,000, but I think a lot of people waiting for that. Um, and I think, if anything, the banks, you know, looking past just the crypto price. And I, I think the banks are less sensitive to the crypto price than people think because of what I said earlier. That's really viewed as transformational for their stack. And I would say it's... Uh, 
how they they can learn through the crypto space for, for them that's really the starting point to learn about the whole process so i think you know we're probably not far from a base i think you know obviously not going to project that say we're not going to pull back further into the end of the year but you know i think the the, the probably the bulk of the worst is done um and yeah. i think now that you've got these these companies coming to market whether it's blackrock or city or bnp um you know sock gen etc um i think the more and more more to come obviously in the pipeline across the, across the whole industry so i think this is i said it before i think uh this provides a floor in the market um and i think basically it's uh it generally it's positive it's six months who knows but i think if you're looking a year plus out i think it's a very positive outlook yeah seamus you're you're uh with Matako the product and services that you guys obviously offer to especially institutional grade the deal with BlackRock and Coinbase, how significant was this for the market itself? Well, I think if you look across all the institutions, I think firms like BlackRock have really driven the, driven the banking sector to accelerate. Um, obviously, Coinbase has the infrastructure in place, but I think it's, it's kind of not going to be a surprise that those large, a large asset manager, one of the largest in the world asset manager like BlackRock, has a significant influence on every bank in the space. So yeah. I think uh, every, nobody wants to lose that business to Coinbase. Uh, it's a great win by Coinbase. Uh, I think they're a great company. But the banks the banks will be building to support them and others like them. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's a very positive. I mean, it's, it's, it's only going to accelerate what you've already seen. Yeah, so good news there. I think that is a good sign for the uh, industry itself. So uh, definitely going to be watching what Matako is doing as you guys continue to kind of partner up with uh, new entities out there. Uh, but thanks so much for uh, stopping in on the show today. We appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. Excellent. All right, so uh, we're going to try to jump in some questions for you guys. I know there are uh, many people kind of look at institutional finance as one of the big categories that has to be a win for us to really kind of see the market start to shift. So I definitely want to get into some questions. I don't know if we have a poll today or not uh, coming through. So if we do, let's pop the poll up. Okay, so would crypto custody options be a deal breaker issue when choosing a traditional bank? No banks are for cash only? Yes. Wow, okay, well this is a little closer than I thought. So meaning that a lot of our, our audience is still looking at self custody and other uh, alternatives out there, whether it's a centralized exchanges. I mean, I'd be kind of curious right now, maybe we can run another poll, guys, is uh, to take a look at self-custody versus centralized exchanges. If we're that close on banks being our custody position, uh, kind of go into that. Let's get into some questions. Jen Smith, if banks are moving on this, lawmakers better catch up. Here's the thing that we uh, continue to see, and I get a chance to talk to a handful of lawmakers right now. They already know that uh, there's a lot, first of all, a lot of lobby groups in DC that are already pushing in this direction. We had a chance to uh, break this down with the Blockchain Association not too long ago. Check that video out because they kind of break down the whole point of the education process for these lawmakers uh, in DC. And really, I think it also starts to set the tone globally. But to your point, Jen, I think you're right. Uh, lawmakers are on kind of a learning uh, crash course right now around what blockchain means because obviously this is going to play into it. Something that Seamus said that I think a lot of people need to pay attention, it was back in the interview, he mentioned that many banks are in the process of essentially replacing their old legacy guard uh, infrastructure, the rails in which those bank systems run on. And if you guys have logged into any bank outside some of these newer banks, that's usually been the case. Online systems, a little bit clunky. Things are a lot slower. It takes a tremendous amount of time for settlements. All those kind of things occur. Uh, so I think we will start to see a lot of movement in that, uh, in that area, especially as they shift over to blockchain. I think that's a, the biggest takeaway from that interview. Uh, Final Kens, uh, I voted for uh, no for me personally, but perhaps people like my mother would, would uh, like banks. I don't know. This is, uh, as I said, I had a chance to speak at a business function with a, a lot of high net worth individuals. And the topic was very straightforward of, and trust was the number one issue right now. It, even these people, and these are people that are multi hundreds of millions. Uh, and what they were looking at is trying to understand blockchain as an investment class. So I think banks are going to start drawing those in. Remember, if banks start to draw those in, obviously that uh, liquid is going into the markets itself. So it's a big opportunity for retail investors like you. So it'll be interesting. But again, if you get one uh, major exchange that starts to get 
a little sideways, then I think this is where banks could come in and sweep up uh, a lot of the open market. Uh, Jerry, BlackRock, Fidel, and the others coming in. Uh, high, basically 70,000 uh, would be possible for Bitcoin to hit uh, 250. All right, so we don't do a lot of price predictions. Um, we look at these, you know, of where markets could trend to, and we've had Gareth Soloway on the show several times. He's looking mostly on the trading cycle side of things, both on uh, short and midterm. But when you look at just Bitcoin in general, and I think in the digital asset space, we've said this often, obviously adoption is a big part of, part of this. Uh, we will start to see the bigger, I think the bigger aspect of this is the institutional grade uh, finance that is really going to make its way into the market early. They'll wade into the waters, and I think retail will will start to drag behind. Once retail starts to come in behind, I think that's when you start to see these kind of numbers start to explode. All right, we've got several live streams today. We've got a couple coming in, uh, so definitely uh, come in. Uh, Paul, last question to you, super healthy. Paul, which one would you trust more, banks or exchanges? I would trust neither. I'd go with self-custody, but that's me. Uh, I trust self-custody. Uh, in those kind of scenarios. When it gets into the type of technology that is at bay right now, this is a revolutionary technology. What blockchain represents for finance, it's finality of verification, uh, it's limited access in terms of, in, in most of the cases, tokenomics. Uh, I think the idea around self-custody just has just a magical um, way of finding its way to people who really want to kind of create a whole new um, life structure because in the past, it's always been someone else holding your money. Remember, when you put money in a bank, it's not your money anymore. They put an IOU out there, but it's not your money anymore. So just think about that for a second. All right, as I said, we're going to have several, uh, uh, two more uh, live streams coming out to you guys today. Uh, we've got a really good one coming up, so make sure and stick around for that. We'll get the notifications. Uh, tag the notifications if you're watching our YouTube channel. That's one of the best ways to get notified, obviously, of the live streams. If you're listening in over on our podcast right now, make sure and tune over here to our live streams. This is the best place where you're going to catch great interviews, a lot of our analysis, all that good stuff. And, of course, you can also join the Diamond Circle, and it's really easy to get into that. If you guys want to reach me, it is out on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.